They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called Naval Legends. U.S. Battleship Alabama British cruiser Belfast and Polish destroyer Błyskawica These ships are very different but they all have one thing in common The Bofors L-60 one of the best automatic anti-aircraft guns of World War II. It is estimated that this model of 40mm automatic cannon shot down more airplanes than all other anti-aircraft guns put together. Caliber 40mm Barrel weight 103 kilograms Barrel length, 56 calibers, 2,250 millimeter. Loading principle, clips, four shots each. Rate of fire, 120 rounds per minute. Shell type, primarily fragmentation. Shell weight, around 900 grams. Maximum vertical range, 7,160 meters. Guns were installed in single, coaxial, quadruple, and six-barreled mounts. She became a very efficient gun for anti-aircraft and surface targets. As uh, time progressed, the, uh, the, the first of the um, Bofors that came on line with the Royal Navy were hand-driven uh, in terms of elevation and training. And uh, they were, had a very basic sight system. And um, again, like a lot of uh, early systems, they were reliant on training uh, ability of the aimers and, and the gun crew. The specifics of World War II artillery relies on the fact that the smaller the caliber is, the more it depends on the gun crew, on their cohesion in combat. The performance characteristics of light guns, anti-aircraft guns, and Bofors in particular, are a combination of the artillery mount itself and the training and coordination of its crew. Especially in battle, when tensions are running very high, there's no time to think, and you need to move very fast, turn around, load new shells, and start firing. And all this happens automatically, without thinking. After a battle, sailors often couldn't even remember what they were doing. That level of performance was achieved through constant training. This weapon is operated by a crew of four. Three on the mounting, the gun layer, the gun trainer, the loader, the fourth member, carries the ammunition from the magazine and loads them into the clips on the side of the gun. The L60 was developed in neutral Sweden. Bofors, a metallurgy company, started manufacturing cannons around the 1870s. Then it was owned by the famous Alfred Nobel for a while. And after World War I, Bofors actively cooperated with the German Krupp Consortium. In March 1932, the official trials of the automatic anti-aircraft cannon L-60 were completed, and it was put on the market. In 1933, British and American military engineers studied the gun and were quite impressed. The Swedish system was more effective than the obsolete British Vickers pom-poms and had more firepower than the Chicago pianos used by the US. The maximum vertical range of Bofors was almost twice that of the British gun and though the Swedish system had a slightly lower rate of fire than its American counterpart, the shells it used were twice as heavy. Great Britain, the USA and 10 other countries purchased a license to produce the gun. 
and by the beginning of World War II, Bofors exported their L60 to 18 countries on different continents. In particular, Denmark, Greece, Egypt, Siam, Australia and Argentina. It wasn't just the Allies that used the Bofors L60. Japanese forces captured several British guns in Singapore. And only their underdeveloped industry prevented them from mass producing them. The German Navy used L60s captured in Poland, Norway and France from 1939 under the designation Flak 28. They were installed on submarines and cruisers Admiral Hipper and Prince Eugen. However, the Swedish gun wasn't ideal and required modernization. The mechanical drive system on ship-based anti-aircraft mounts would break down due to its exposure to salt water and needed to be replaced with a hydraulic one. The air cooling of the barrel also had to be replaced with water cooling. Also, some design modifications were required to mass-produce the gun. One of the main problems of the Bofors L60's application was a high reliance on the training and skills of the gun crew. The job of the loader is to carry or load the gun. by lifting the clip, dropping into the weapon so. Once he has done that, he then taps the gun layer on his head to let him know the gun is loaded. Loading a gun like this wasn't easy. Ammunition had to be taken out of a box and carried to the gun. As the gun constantly rotated, the carrier had to run around it with a clip of shells in his hands to pass it to the loader. This position on the gun is known as the trainer's position and these handles are turned or reversed to allow the gun to move backwards and forwards on the target using the graticle sight in front of you. Following the tracer being fired from the gun, we can adjust for uh, aim off if we are too far in front or too far behind the target to allow uh, the other side of the gun which is the layers side, to then manufacture the elevation for the target. As time went on, the gun developed and um, so that we could come away from the, uh, the hand-driven gun, uh, she was turned into a hydraulic-driven gun, so she had uh, pressure tanks and oils and such like. Uh, which sped up the, uh, the training and the elevation of the gun uh, so that they could lock onto targets uh, quicker. This is the gun layer's position. He was also the captain of the gun and responsible for giving orders to the rest of the crew. He would, for instance, initiate the loading sequence by telling the loader to bring the gun to half cock. This means that the weapon can then be loaded with rounds into the auto feeder. He was also responsible for aiming the weapon using the 300 knot sight in front of him, using the tracers from the rounds to adjust accordingly. The sight arrangement uh, was going away from the um the spiderweb type of sight to a, a mirror type of sight, uh, which was basically what we'd call a head-up display today. On small displacement ships, anti-aircraft guns were aimed manually, but on cruisers, battleships and aircraft carriers, the firing data was produced by directors. Special systems that controlled anti-aircraft artillery by calculating targeting parameters and sending them centrally to the receiving devices on guns. The information on target parameters was supplied by anti-aircraft rangefinders and later by gun radars. The command to engage or fire comes directly from the command and without further ado, the gun captain would press the firing push. As long as he held his foot 
on the firing push, the gun would continue to fire as long as it had enough ammunition in the hopper to keep feeding it. The guns created a fire barrage, which was almost impossible for a single aircraft or entire squadrons to penetrate. You can see it in old newsreels. There's literally a wall of fire in the air and some plane trying to get through it. The Bofors L-60 proved its worth during World War II. The anti-aircraft gun Bofors L-70 became its logical continuation. The human factor is crucial in wars. A man can become frightened, maybe poorly trained, or something unexpected can happen to them. As a result, the struggle to minimize the influence of the human element and to increase the gun's survivability and rate of fire led to the development of the modernized Bofors L-70, which required minimal human input if compared to the very first Bofors gun, such as the L-60. However, the L-60 remained in use on some ships. In 1982, during the Falklands War, which involved Great Britain and Argentina, the British managed to shoot down a jet plane using this Bofors gun. Even in the 1970s, when artillery was gradually replaced by missile systems, Bofors cannons remained in service. Not only the upgraded L-70s, but also the veteran L-60. It can still be found on some German minesweepers and the heavily armed US AC-130 gunships which provide fire support to ground units. Of all the weapons used by the warring parties in World War II, a special place is occupied by a gun from a Swiss company, Orlikon. This autocannon was operated by the militaries on both sides of the front line, but only the Allies managed to reveal its full potential. Using the Swiss-designed weapon, the Allied navies provided their ships with highly effective air defense. The uh, Orlikon is a Swiss design gun made in the UK under license and uh, it was introduced into the Royal Navy in 1940. Specifications of the Orlikon anti-aircraft gun. Calibre 20 millimeters, barrel weight with breech block from 64 to 68 kilograms, gun length 2,210 millimeters, ammunition feed, drum magazine holding 45, 60, 75 or 100 rounds. Rate of fire from 250 to 320 rounds per minute. The guns were fitted in single, twin and quadruple mountings. The gun is used for um, fast uh, surface targets um, and for anti-aircraft as well. So the, the gun was fitted to many, many naval ships from aircraft carriers right down to the smallest uh, minesweepers. In 1941, England commissioned battleship Duke of York with six Orlikon cannons on board. It was the first British warship armed with Swiss anti-aircraft guns. One of the key requirements that the British put forward for Orlikans was that they be operable and maintainable for unqualified personnel, like fishermen and sailors from the merchant fleet. This condition proved to be quite far-sighted. Before World War II kicked off, Great Britain ordered 1,500 guns from Switzerland and purchased a license for their production. By 1943, single-barrel Orlikan anti-aircraft guns were no longer effective against fast and well-protected enemy aircraft. A good solution to this problem was the development of multi-gun mounts.
This is a 20 millimeter Orlikon Mark 11 mounting fitted with two 20 millimeter cannons, each capable of firing up to 350 rounds a minute per gun. However, the magazine only holds 60 rounds. So the rate of fire is dependent upon the uh, crew's ability to resupply magazines to the gun throughout the action. The twin mounts were fed with ammunition from the left and right hand sides. To avoid mistakes during loading, the magazine for the left gun was painted in a bright colour. This is the 60 round magazine which fits on the cannon. This one is empty but is still very heavy. Imagine it filled with 60 rounds. Fits on the cannon like this and would be changed perhaps three or four times during an engagement. The loader's job is not just to load the magazine. She has to put the bullets or the shells inside the magazine. Each shell is individually loaded into the magazine, pre-greased to allow for lubrication through the firing system. As you can see, the aimer uses his body weight to move the uh, mounting in a training motion. The elevation is adjusted by the hand wheel you can see here. When he's given the command by the gunnery controller and once he has got the gun onto the target, he calls aim a target and is given the command to engage. At that point, he takes the safety catch off and fires the weapon. When a shot is fired, gunpowder gases apply pressure to the projectile, which starts moving out of the barrel, and the cartridge, which pushes the breech, makes it slide along the barrel. The weight of the breech and the return force of the spring, pressed by it, are matched in such a way so that the moment the projectile leaves the barrel, a spent cartridge is ejected from the breech block, and the next round is fed to her place from the magazine. At this moment, the recoil spring pushes the breech back, ramming the shell into the chamber. There are two loaders for this gun, one for the right gun and one for the left. Obviously, they don't just lift full magazines onto the gun and take the empty ones away. Their duties are also to act as the emergency crew. Should anything happen to the aimer, who sits on the uh, left-hand side, then the gun can be fired manually by one person from the back of the gun here. The guns in the twin mount fire in turn. As a result, its cyclic rate of fire is about 600 rounds per minute. The Orlikon was used on ships as a short-range anti-aircraft gun. Its effective range of fire was up to two kilometers. You can say it was a last chance weapon, especially for American ships, as they had to face Japanese kamikaze attacks in the Pacific. During the war, Orlik and auto cannons were extensively installed on the ships of the Allies. For example, the American Essex-class aircraft carriers were equipped with up to 50 Orlikon guns. Therefore, the number of people on board the ships became significantly larger due to the anti-aircraft gun crews. Remembering that all the crew are actually linked together by the gunnery control communication system, they all can hear the commands from the gunnery director platform and the gun master gunner. This box relates to the Type 6 gyro sight and is the controlled inputs which are given to him by the uh, gunnery control, gunnery director pro, uh, platform personnel prior to the start of the engagement and set such things as wind speed, direction and air temperature which affect the ballistics of the ammunition. If, during the engagement, which obviously is very noisy, 
there is a need to stop firing, the gunnery director officer in the gunnery director platform will press the check fire bell, which operates this bell you see here. And this rings continuously until the aimer replies through his communication system, check, 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 which informs the gunnery officer that he has stopped firing. During World War II, the Allies produced over 300,000 Orlikan cannons. Many of them were later modified and upgraded, but in general, they still remained a Swiss design. The gun was too advanced for the time when it was developed in the early 1930s, and only when World War II broke out did this cannon occupy a niche where it was unmatched on both opposing sides. According to US statistics, from December 1941 through September 1944, as many as 32% of all Japanese aircraft were shot down by naval Orlikan guns. In the second half of 1942, about 48% of enemy aircraft losses resulted from the use of these small caliber cannons. After the war, the 20mm Orlikan AA gun remained in service with many navies around the globe, until it was inevitably replaced by more advanced systems. However, even today, you can still see the World War II-designed Orlikan guns installed on some small patrol ships. 